Okay, now that we've talked about Wundt, the father of psychology, we have one last group of German contributors to discuss. Ebbinghaus, Muller, and Kolpe, and uh, some of their contributions to German psychology in the 1800s and even the 1900s. Hermann Ebbinghaus was a German psychologist who was well known for his study of memory. He conducted most of his experimental studies using himself as the only participant, but he was able to identify several principles of memory that have stood the test of time and that we still know to be relatively true universally today. In the 1870s, Ebbinghaus began to study memory using what he called nonsense syllables. I have a couple of examples at the bottom of the screen. These are syllables, things that can be pronounced, but that have no real meaning to the test taker. So in English, these would be nonsense syllables. He also studied how humans forget, how much they forget, when they forget, how often they forget it. He studied practice, the difference between cramming and distributed learning. And he also studied how we learn information in a series, how we learn to string together a variety of different ideas in order to remember them. Remember that Ebbinghaus studied only his own memory. He did not bring in freshman students from Gen Psych and ask them to complete memory tests. He spent months at a time trying to memorize different lists of words and recall those lists of words in an effort to figure out how memory works. Lists of seven or fewer syllables can be learned in a single repetition. Memory performance is better when learning is distributed as opposed to cramming sessions. The rate of forgetting is rapid at first and then slows over time. All three of these conclusions are true of most humans in most cultures. Let's take a closer look at Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. He studied the rate at which we forget information. After you take an exam, a multiple choice in-person exam, you begin to forget information rapidly, quickly. The rate of forgetting is fast at first. In the first few days, you will forget most of the information that you're going to forget. After a few weeks, that rate of forgetting begins to slow. And after several months, whatever it is that you remember after several months is probably going to hang out in your memory for quite some time. Georg Elias Muller is also well known for his experiments on memory. He was a German psychologist who earned his PhD in 1873 from the University of Göttingen. Muller disagreed with Ebbinghaus about a few things. Muller took the stance that learning and memory require more active participation that in order to learn the human really has to make an effort uh, and participate in the process. In order to support this idea, this deviation from Ebbinghaus, Muller did two major things that Ebbinghaus did not do. Muller invented his own equipment. In this image, you see his memory drum, which was a device that rotated and presented different stimuli to his participants. And that's number two. Muller studied the memory of participants not of himself. He actually brought people into his lab and using his equipment presented different stimuli so that he could measure um, the outcomes. He also discovered a concept known as retroactive interference. This occurs when, when new information that we learn interferes with our ability to recall other information. You might experience retroactive interference during finals week when you're trying to study for two or three or four different tests. 
if you have two tests on the same day, say two tests on Wednesday, the information you learn for the second exam, the afternoon exam, can make it difficult for you to learn information for the first exam, for the morning exam. Uh, the second exam information interferes with your recall of the information that you learned first. The final German pioneer that I'd like to talk about in this lecture is a man by the name of Oscar Kolpe. He was a German psychologist who is actually known by many historians as the second founder of psychology. One of the reasons that many of us don't know about Kolpe, one of the reasons he's not as famous as Wundt and some of the other early pioneers, um, is because he was a big supporter of structuralism, of structural psychology, which eventually falls out of favor and is replaced by functionalism and behaviorism. In the 1880s, he studied with Wundt, the father of psychology at the University of Leipzig, and he earned his PhD in 1887. He also worked in Muller's lab for one year. Although he studied with Wundt and Muller, he had his own ideas about how the human mind worked. He did not agree with the two of them that complex mental processes could not be studied by the experimental method. Kolpe believed that complex thoughts, complex processes, even complex behaviors could be studied using the scientific method. So he adapted Wundt's original method of internal perception and called it systematic experimental introspection. It differed in a few minor ways, but one of the things that he did that was different from Wundt is he had participants wait until after they completed complex tasks to describe their experience. Wundt presented stimuli and had his participants describe their experience as they experienced it. Kolpe also made two other discoveries that are worth mentioning. He found that people tend to use the same set of problem-solving strategies across tasks. He considered this, he called this a mental set, a person's typical way of solving a problem. He also found evidence for imageless thought. The notion that ideas are not always based on images. The idea that sometimes we can think about things without having a mental representation of those things in our minds. And one final thing about Kolbe, two of his graduate students, Wertheimer and Kafka, eventually went on to establish Gestalt psychology, which was fairly popular in the early 1900s. So that's all for the week four lecture. Um, I will see you next week to learn more about Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection, as well as Francis Galton.